Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Nature Life today. My name is Anna Rita. I'll be your host for this session. And just before we start, can I ask who has been to a Nature Life before? I do recognize a couple of you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And um, people do come back because every day Nature Life is different. Every day you have a chance to meet a different scientist. And we have quite a lot of scientists working here in the museum. Does anyone know how many scientists we have working behind the scenes? Hands up if you want to try just to guess. Yes, how many scientists do you think we have here? Say it again. A thousand! Wow! It's less than that, but it's a very good guess because we have quite a, a huge number. Oh, I know you know. <laughs> uh, okay, another one, guess. 200, it's more than 200. Can you believe it? Okay, last chance. Who wants to try? Yes. 448, and there was another one? 300. It's over 300, so that's, that's quite good, over 300. Although if we count with the students, the ones who are learning how to become scientists, we have one of them here today, we have 525, which is quite a lot. So let's meet our scientists for today. You might have met Max. Max comes a lot. But Lucia and Lydia are here for the first time ever, <laughs> so they might be a little bit nervous. <laughs> Lucia, can you tell us what you do here at the museum? I work in a coleoptera or beetle department where we uh, help with beetle preparation and looking after collections and more specifically I work with beetles from Tanzania. Okay, Lydia, you work wi with Lucia, what, what do you do? Mm. Yep, so as Lucia said, we work with the beetles that have been collected in Tanzania, um, which involves taking specimens from alcohol and preparing them so that we can put them into the dry collection. <laughs> <laughs> and this is you, <laughs> a couple of years ago we <laughs> born you in, <laughs> in a field trip. Max, you oversee all the beetle collection, uh, but tell us, what does that involve? Well, we have this very large collection, it's one of the largest and most important collections in the world. And it consists of 22,000 drawers of beetles, probably about 10 million specimens. And every one of those specimens has been individually pinned and individually mounted and labelled by somebody carefully and intricately, and this is the kind of work that um, Lydia and Lucy are doing, which is why people like this are so important for the museum. Okay. I didn't say at the beginning, but during these 25 minutes, if you have any questions at all about beetles or collecting or uh, uh, about um, our collections, just pop your hand and one of our three speakers will do their best to answer your questions. So today we are going to have a journey from the field and to the collections. What, what's the journey that a, be a beetle has to take? But uh, Lydia, you are collecting in Tanzania, that's the project you are working on. Why Tanzania? Why are we collecting there? So Tanzania is well known for its megafauna, which are the big animals, but it's not so well known for the smaller things, especially the insects. So we have um, scientists going out to really remote places that people haven't collected in before and coming back with pots full of things for us to sort through. <laughs> okay, let's go then into collecting. How is it life in the field? And um, Lucia, you have joined the museum. When did you join? In the summer. In the, s in the, in th in the summer. And you were lucky enough to join uh, f an expedition to Borneo, not to Tanzania. <laughs> but you are going to use some of your pictures to show us how I is it uh, that you collect in the field. Do you want to show us one of some of your tools that you yes. use? I think <laughs> you have some at the, at the front. So there are various trapping techniques that you can use to collect insects. One of the basic ones is uh, sweep net which you use to collect from grass or lower vegetation and you just simply need to sweep the grass and you need to make sure that you keep moving because otherwise insects would fly out and at the end you just need to close it so they don't fly off and uh, the other trap would be the beating tray oops my head and this uh, is again for lower trees or bra uh, bushes you have a simply stick in your hand and you just yeah. Hit the trees and see what falls from them. So these are these traps would uh, collect um, all the different types of insects. But then you can have a bit more specialized traps, like this flight interception trap. And uh, it works. It consists of this net that is stretched stretched out in between two trees in relatively open area where you would expect insects to be flying. And this trap is really good for beetles um, in particular because when beetle hits the net, its uh, response is to play dead. So it will tuck its legs in and it will just fall down down to the colorful trays that you can see underneath, which are filled with water and a preservative or alcohol. And then on the other hand, if uh, 
wasps or fly, for example, hits a net, it would fly up. So for this, we have uh, melee traps. Okay, we have one here. And I think we will need some help. Could you help us showing something here at the front? Can you come here and help Lucia with her trap? And it's someone to hold it here. Okay, hold one in here. And someone to hold it really on the high. other side. Can anyone, do you want to come up? No? Do you want to come? Okay. Oh, you, do you want to come as well? <laughs> and you can also stretch it like this here. Okay, Lucia, tell us how that, that works yeah. then. Okay, perfect. I only this. <laughs> <laughs> so this trap is symmetrical, and you can see it may be on the picture. <laughs> it looks like a tent a bit. And insects would fly in, hit the net, and then just fly up al along the net, and will be channeled up all the way up here because that's the only way to go. And then there is a hole in here, so it would just fly up and down in the pot because that's the only way. And then we have uh, alcohol in the pot ready. So <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, a problem with the um, with the slides, but can you show? So th the insects go into here, yes. and that's what you then bring back to the museum. They come yes. into something like that's this. That's uh, content of melee strap. And we can just see it's really full of, of yeah. insects. And you leave it out maybe for a couple of days, two or three days. You can leave it out if it's filled with alcohol. Wow. Yeah. Any questions for Lucia <laughs> about leaving in the field? <laughs> Any questions at all? Thank you. Not at this point. So uh, can you just give a, a round of applause to our volunteers to help us here? <laughs> maybe they will have some future helping you, <laughs> Lucia. So um, what is you? you mm, you take all these traps but, uh, um, and you have to set them up. It, it's quite a hard work uh, and it's quite also an adventure. Do you face many dangers in wha uh, when you are out uh, in field work? Well, it's very humid and very hot in, in the tropics, so it's quite difficult only to walk because as soon as you enter the forest, you feel like you are sweaty, but it's just so humid that you feel really wet. And because it's so wet, uh, there are some special... <laughs> Does anyone would like to guess who, what this is for? <laughs> Can anyone, does anyone know <laughs> what this is? Yes. They are to put in your feet, yes. Did you, someone here at the front? Yes, do you have a oh. leech sock? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, so so you why do you need to use them? Because, because it's so humid, leeches just live uh, all around in the tropics. They don't need to live in water, so they wait for you everywhere on the leaves. And as soon as you move, uh, they'll just start crawling towards you. And you put these uh, on the top of your socks in your shoe and tie it here so they don't get in your socks, because sometimes they can bite you through socks as well. So leeches is a big problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't want that, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Any questions you would like to ask Lucia about collecting beetles, or about life in the field? Yes, we have a question at the back, yes? Is there any risk that you're um, capturing or something, killing beetles, uh, animals that are rare mm. in, in your technique? Uh, Max, uh, do you want to take that? Because you are more ex a more well, experienced um, collector. rarity in insects is quite different from rarity in large animals. In that with, with large animals, you'll get a, a limited population. And if you're killing individuals from that population, you're going to reduce the population quite quickly. Whereas insects, because of their position in the food chain, even the rare species can exist in enormous Not populations spiking. as long as the habitat is in good condition. So if you get a rare species, what it usually means is that it lives in a habitat that is very limited or very isolated. And the way to damage that species is by harming the habitat where it lives or cutting down the forest where it lives or setting fires or something like that. But if you take a few individuals out of the uh, population, which is what you're doing with these trapping techniques, you're not doing anything different from what a bird would do if it passed through that environment. So insect populations are very robust to killing of individuals. What they're not robust to is, is large-scale habitat change, which is, of course, what we're trying to prevent. Okay. Any more questions you would like to ask? Yes. Uh, how do you know the best Okay. How do you know you are collecting everything you can? Uh, no, we you, we use different types of uh, traps, Lucia. These techniques have been used for years now, so we know 
kind of what, <laughs> what types of insects uh, are they collecting. Of course, they'll collect some other insects as well, but then that will go to other specialists and other departments. And also you have uh, some traps that are only specifically for one type of beetle, for example, when, when I was doing a dung beetle trapping. We have Lucia here with the trap. <laughs> 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 so over the years, y you want to, to, to get things like uh, the beetles who live in here, in dung, and you had to, to uh, develop a trap that will get that, yes. and that's what you have in there. And I will <laughs> just yeah. looking for Unfortunately, where the trap is. I had to use my own supply. Because sometimes in the tropics it's very difficult to get hold of, uh, for example, cattle dung. Um, and sometimes locals think that um, you could maybe use elephant dung, but then they think it's not really good to do because they use it as a mar marks as well to their territories. So if you start moving it around, it might end up in fight. And also it's a health risk to use a different type of dung because you know your own bacteria. So if you wanted to use monkey's dung, for example, it might be a health issue for you. <laughs> so it's very simple trap. So you have only you have plastic cup that is inserted in soil and a bait is hanging above the trap and pot is filled with preservative again or water alcohol. And then, um, yeah, it's very good in tropics to cover it with something uh, so the pot doesn't get filled with water. You can use big leaves or more sophisticated way how I used with chopsticks and plates. And then beetles just try to get in bed, but they actually can't get in because it's enclosed and they'll just yeah, crawl around and walk around and eventually uh, fall in the pot. So different traps attract <laughs> different, <laughs> different beetles. Any more questions about trapping um, and collecting in the field? Okay, uh, Max, that was would be my last question of the event today. We can go through Well, I think <laughs> if somebody would show that drawer, I think uh, it'll become very clear that there are not very many specimens of each species. There are actually very many species, and most of them are only represented by... Um, if somebody wants to hold that drawer up and yeah, show it... Yeah, I was going it, to uh, see if the camera was... As a sample of the kind of material that people are bringing back. It's coming. The camera is coming. <laughs> there actually, you'll find that there are a lot of different types, but not very many individuals of each type. And um, even in the cases when you have 15 or 20 of the same species, it's, it's useful to see the variation within that species, especially if you're trying to work out whether it's really one species or whether there's more than one species there. You need to see more than one individual to have a rough idea of the variation that's there. Excellent question over there. So when th th we collect a lot, uh, uh, well, <laughs> w what we need, uh, here is uh, the content of one of your dung beetles wraps, and then they arrive to the museum and someone has to take care of them, and that's where Lydia comes in. Uh, Lydia, do you want to show us and have a, a little demonstration of what you do and what you get <laughs> <laughs> when the things arrive to you? Okay, so when things arrive at the museum, we get them in these pots like we were showing you before. Um, quite often we have them in these small ones. I'm just going to tip one out so you can have a look at what sorts of things we get inside the trap. So these are all preserved in alcohol to stop them from rotting. Um, so the traps don't specifically collect beetles, <laughs> obviously. So in here we have cockroaches. I don't know if, if I can get one under the visualizer so you can see it properly. Yeah, so we get cockroaches, beetles, flies, hymenoptera, which is wasps. Um, and I'm actually going to mount one of these today so you can see how we do it. So we start by drying it off. This one is a water beetle. to dry off the alcohol so that, um, yeah, so it doesn't rot while it's on its pin waiting to go into the collection. Move this. Some help. Thank you. So we have all sorts of special tools that we use. Um, this one, to start with put it here. This is a pinning block. And you have these different holes. Um, so if you have a big beetle, then you can put it on your pin at a certain level, um, smaller one, a different level. 
So it'll start by putting a pin through the elytra, which is the hardened wing case. And we always put the pin on the right-hand side between the second and third legs, just so that everything's the same in the collection and just so that you're not going through anything um, that's... So if you're going through one of the legs, then obviously that's going to be a problem when you come to identify it. So you line it up so you're not going through anything. That's a very delicate job. Oh. Make sure it's... Uh. <laughs> it's difficult to do it with all these people watching, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> 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 okay, do you have any questions while uh, Lydia is doing it? Anything you'd like to ask about what she's doing? Yes. If, if let's say you lose a leg or something, you have to start from scratch. Oh, well, so what if happens you lose if a leg, <laughs> then... Um, <laughs> So then you have to let it dry out, and then you'll just glue it back on with water-soluble glue. So say you've... Be <laughs> 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 okay, careful, Boston so wants you to break <laughs> any legs <laughs> now, so be careful. Um, and sometimes when they've been in alcohol for a long time, they'll get really, really stiff, so you have to do exercises with their legs to sort of loosen them up a little bit. <laughs> So we arrange all the legs in a way that you can see um, like the important features. So maybe the tarsi, which are the small segments in the end of the legs. Um, different families of beetle will have different numbers of tarsi. So it's really important that you can see all of these features. And the antennae as well. If you can, it's good to make it so that you can see them. And with hydrophilids, which is this family of water beetle, um, they're known for having like three little club segments on the end of their antennae, which they use for when they come up out of the water, is to break the surface tension of the water. How long does it take you to pin one, uh, one beetle? It depends the size and like of how stiff audience. it is and stuff. <laughs> Maybe now a little bit longer because I've got lots of people watching. But in a day you do 20 or is that too much? Um, we'd fill like one of these boards or two of these boards in a day. So, yeah. Oh, that's quite a lot. You need, to <laughs> you need to go through. Any more questions you'd like to ask Lydia? Yes, a question from you. Yes. couldn't hear you. Would you mind asking your question to the microphone so that everyone can hear? How do you know it's a type beetle? How do you know it's a beetle? Okay, so we can look at just the general body plan um, and you can see, like I said before, with the hardened wing cases, the elytra, that's um, like a feature of beetles, but also um, by looking at their mouth parts, if you you can get confused maybe between bugs and beetles and the difference would be um, that beetles have like chewing mandibles whereas bugs have a sort of straw-like um, structure called a rostrum which they push into maybe like plants and then they'll suck out all the juices. So this is a bug and you can see its rostrum there. So that's one way that we can tell that it's a beetle. This one is a beetle, I think. <laughs> okay, did you have a question as well? Do you want to shout nice and clear? Okay. When do you think you'd have exhausted uh, researching every beetle on the planet? Oh, <laughs> good question for <laughs> you, Max. Years, 20 years, 100 years. When, when uh, um, are, uh, <laughs> are we going to find out all the beetles in our planet? Do either of you want to answer that or shall I attempt? You, I think Maybe. It's quite a difficult <laughs> question. Um, We've been doing this since 1758 when Linnaeus started the process of giving names to all of the organisms, which is, of course, you know, is what Adam was asked to do in the Bible, but nobody actually started doing it until 1758. And um, in the time since Linnaeus, which is just over 250 years, if my maths is right, we've named about 400,000 species of beetle. And at present, we're naming as a global community, between 1,000 and 2,000 a year. So the rate has not slowed. If anything, the rate is still picking up. Um, 
At the same time, of course, a lot of the environments where these insects live are being destroyed, and so there's the possibility or the, the certainty that species are becoming extinct before they've even been discovered. So you've got the process of discovery and you've got the process of destruction, and that these are going to cross at some point. But at the moment, we're finding new species the whole time. And we're finding new species in the collections as well that have been collected 100 or 200 years ago. So there's, there's a great deal more to discover. In fact, tomorrow we have a scientist talking about the, a dinosaur, that the, the, the oldest dinosaur that it just found laying in our collection. It was there, but no one had really had time to study it. And tomorrow, if you come back to, to Nature Live, you can find about that. Uh, Lucy, have we found uh, new species on, on the collections, the Tanzania collections we are, you are working on? Uh, is still in the process of, of um, identification, but there are a um, couple of wasps that are found that were new species, and one dung beetle just recently that has just been described. But I think there will be probably plenty more ones that are all identified. Oh, good, we look forward for that. Have you finished, Lydia? <laughs> yes, it's not the best one I've ever done, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well done. <laughs> Do you want to show us another tray that you have with yeah. some prepared ones in the case? So then we end up with loads of them on one like That's this. Quite yep. a delicate process. So you mm. need to really separate them all. Yeah, but it's really important to keep the labels with the specimens because you really wouldn't want to like, forget where they're all from and how they were collected and who by and all of those things. So after that, what's next? After all the pinning, what do you do next? After... After this out. stage, yes. So then we put it in an oven for three to five days. It's a very low heat. <laughs> um, and we just leave it in there, let it dry out. It uh, depends how long you leave it in there, like whether it's a big beetle or a small beetle. And then we'll take all the pins out and attach labels nicely, all at the same height. Um, that'll just tell you where it was collected and all that sort of information. And then we will display them all like this <laughs> and then they'll be sent off to be identified so we can identify them to a certain level but then there might be a specialist in another country that would need to come and work on them or we would send them to them and um yeah we've got lots of specimens at the moment that have been sent to various people around the world good and that, that's uh, you and, and Lucia, very proud to <laughs> be displaying your, your drawers. And uh, then <laughs> they go at last to the collection and that's where you Max come in. Uh, our collections are huge. Someone that said, uh, you have just said why they are huge, why we need so many. Um, who, you, who uses our collections? Well, the collections are used by scientists from all over the world. And most of the people who come to work on the collections are taxonomists, that is, people who are concerned with the science of classification and the description of the biodiversity of the world. But we also have other audiences that use the collection. We get a lot used by educators. We get used by artists. We get people who are involved with pest control, people who are involved with finding beetles for biological control of, uh, of, of, of weeds or uh, invasive plants. We get people coming to use the collections to look at, uh, at climate change modeling, because um, each specimen, as, as, as Lucia and Lydia have been telling you, has got a label saying when it was collected and where it was collected. So you can look over a 200-year period and see whether things are emerging earlier in the year or whether things are, are sort of coming out at different times of year, which might be to do with changes in, in, the, in the weather or the climate. Uh, there's a whole range of different uses that the collection's put to. And of course, things like DNA that have been discovered more recently. Uh, people are now looking at DNA from old specimens, which when the specimen was collected, nobody had heard of DNA and possibly nobody had even heard of genetics. And so there are uses that the collections uh, can be put to that we don't even understand yet and that probably we don't even know about yet. We get about three to 500 scientists a year coming through this department using the, uh, the collections. We have a question at the back. Yes? Have they always, have they always been collected and stored this way? Uh, that's correct, yes. Um, people started pinning specimens sometime in the 1700s. And uh, uh, the, the pin is, is just a very convenient way of handling the specimen because it becomes very brittle when it's dry. So you can handle it by the pin. And uh, yeah, we've got collections that were made in the 1700s that are presented in almost exactly the same way as nowadays. But we put more detail on the label. Quite often they just put Africa or something really useful like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any final questions? Any more questions? Yeah, quite a lot of hands up. Yes. Uh, 
Um, I did mean to do it on both sides, but I think I was just <laughs> trying to do it quickly. <laughs> okay, yes? I think that this is for you. This is for me? <laughs> um, well, actually, that's a big challenge, is recognising where to draw the lines between species, because you'll often get very, very similar insects, and it can be quite difficult to say whether you've got a single variable species or whether you've got multiple species. And quite often, if you're using different sources of information, you can discover different things. Like, if they all look the same to the naked eye, but if you look at some of the internal structures, like the internal genitalia or some of the mouth parts, then you may find differences which are associated with reproduction or feeding um, because the different species reproduce or feed differently. Um, alternatively, you can look at the DNA or something like that and you may find characteristics that distinguish species that look identical on all of the morphological structures. So if you look at them in different ways, you'll find different ways of drawing the lines between uh, species. And this is one of the things that taxonomists are always doing, is revising the work of previous taxonomists and drawing the lines sometimes slightly differently. And this is even happening in our own species. We have debates as to whether Neanderthal man is actually the same species as we are, or a subspecies, or a distinct species. So even in, in, in humans, um, we're, we're not quite clear where we're dealing with fossils, how many species of fossil human there are. So, you know, Tanzanian beetles, it's, it's, it's a whole different world. Yes. Is the notion of species rigorously defined? No. There's, there's no definition that works across the whole of the animal and plant kingdom. So it's a judgment call? Yes, I mean, I had a professor who told me that a good species is what a good taxonomist says it is. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it sounds like a joke, but actually there isn't a better definition out there yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, work in progress. Yes, it's back. What's the most important thing we can learn from I studying you want to beetles? That? What any of you want to? What What does it mean for you, uh, personally? Why do you like studying beetles? Putting you personally, on the spotlight. Personally, I think this world has so much diversity and so many interesting, wonderful things, and I just love to be able to have a look at one little snapshot of that and have a look at some of the diversity um, of beetles. So for me, I think that might be one thing. <laughs> Lucia, is that the same thing that, um, that drives you? Also, I think it's very important to know what the beetles are doing and what's their function. So if you, for example, have some pests that attack your trees, you want to know what species it is in order to eliminate it. So you must be able to identify important species. <laughs> and Max, you have been, been you, uh, I'm, I'm, I can say, uh, you decided to work on beetles when you were 12. <laughs> uh, at, at the oldest, probably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> why, um, th th the reason why you chose to, to, to study beetles, th did that change? What, what, what have you learned with them? Well, I think years? it's the same for most of us. I mean, what I would say would be the same as, 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 as Lydia and Lucia have just said aspects of the two. There's this enormous diversity out there. I and mean, there was a famous uh, case of an evolutionary biologist, uh, J.B.S. Haldane, who was asked by some clerics uh, what his studies of nature had taught him about the mind of God. <laughs> and Haldane was obviously not a religious uh, person because he turned around and said, well, he must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> and um, we, we like this quotation. We repeat it quite often, of course. Um, but there must be a reason why there are so many species of beetle. About 20% of living organisms are beetles. And you just think, how can they divide the world into that many pieces that they've all got something to do? And it's only when you start losing species that you start realizing what it is that they did. And, and, and a good example is that when um, uh, the first Europeans brought cattle and sheep to Australia, they didn't bring any dung beetles. And if somebody had asked them, are you going to bring any dung beetles? They said, well, what do we want dung beetles for? You know, they're just nasty animals that roll around in dung and little beetles. But the problem that they soon had was that the pasture was just being covered with dung and it was breeding flies and the flies were spreading disease, not only to the cattle and sheep, but also to the people. And you needed to get more and more and more land to support the same number of cattle because all of the dung was drying and killing the grass. And so you needed more land to, to get enough grass for the cattle. And Eventually, the Australian government did a big program where they identified dung beetles from Africa and, and, and Europe, where the cattle and sheep had come from, 
and introduced them into Australia and solved the problem in about five or six years. And it just shows that if you take a beetle out of the equation, you don't realize what the consequences are going to be until potentially it's too late. And because they were just Australia, they could move the beetles from somewhere else. But if you wipe the dung beetle out from the face of the earth, you would have a problem that you may not be able to solve. So until we know what these things are doing, we can't really estimate what they're worth to us. And that's why our collections are so important and the work of everyone is so important. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. It's three, three o'clock now. Uh, but uh, you are all invited to come down. Please do not touch anything, but you can have a closer look and even take some pictures and continue to chat with our three speakers today. Uh, look forward to see you again. Every day we have a different event on. But for now, can you join me in a big, big thanks to Lucia, Max and Lydia. Thank you.